everyone. Uh, welcome to Pass Forward Online 2020. Um, my name is Priya Chaya and I am the Associate Director for Online Content here at the National Trust for Historic Preservation. And uh, you are in Increasing Awareness, Indigenous History and Historic Preservation. Um, before we get started, I have a few housekeeping notes. Thanks, Chris. Um, so I'm not gonna read everything on the slide, but I'm gonna pull out some specific details. Um, the session is being recorded. Um, please abide by the conference code of conduct uh, during the conference sections. I'll drop the link in the chat if you haven't had a chance to read that yet. Um, all participants will be muted during the presentation. Uh, but if you have a question, we do have the chat function enabled for questions or comments and I'll be available off camera to help answer some of those if I can. Um, or I will send you to the place where you can find the answer. Um, and also you can find help to a whole host of questions in the FAQ section on the website or use the attendee customer service room through your socio app, um, which is accessible, like I said, in the virtual platform schedule. And finally, for accessibility purposes, closed captioning is available for all of the Zoom meetings. Uh, you just have to enable it yourself in your um, using your audio settings. Um, and with that, I'm going to hand it over to Ned Blackhawk, who will introduce uh, the session for today. Thank you, Priya, and welcome to um, our session, Increasing Awareness, Indigenous History and Historic Preservation. My name is Ned Blackhawk. I'm a professor of history and American studies at Yale University, where I run a whole range of um, Native American studies themed uh, kind of programming uh, that highlights uh, our campus's particular uh, um, strengths as well as uh, interests in Native American historic um, awareness and preservation concerns. And I think you'll find throughout our, our five presentations this morning a series of overlapping uh, questions and um, uh, strategies that many of us uh, have answered or have been trying to answer regarding uh, the um, National Trust's uh, concerns about uh, telling the full American story building stronger communities, investing in uh, preservation's future, and even um, uh, saving certain historic sites. We don't have a lot of time, so I'm going to uh, uh, just begin by sharing some of the work that I've been doing on campus here um, that uh, highlights the um, uh, forms of awareness that we've been building on campus related to Native American um, issues and uh, studies. Um, I hope uh, everyone can see this well, um, but this is a little PowerPoint that I made this morning um, that uh, kind of highlights some of the kind of recent activities that our community has been engaged in. Uh, the first slide is from a recent, for example, a Yale University Art Gallery show that opened um, last fall. It seems like uh, much longer ago than it was, but I think on November 1st of 2019, uh, the Yale University Art Gallery, uh, one of the uh, world's great university encyclopedic art museums, uh, held its first Native American art sh uh, show. And we um, had a group of students uh, curating and exhibiting a series of uh, um, uh, both uh, exhibitions as well as uh, panel presentations, as well as a publication with this theme and title, Place Nations, Generations Beings, that celebrates 200 years of indigenous art um, here on campus. I don't have a great uh, amount of time to really highlight some of the kind of um, particulars within it, but just generally to say that this exhibition was a strategy that our campus used to highlight some of the on long-going, um, long-standing issues and uh, sets of relationships, sometimes painful, sometimes violent, sometimes supportive, that our uh, 300 plus year old institution has maintained with native nations, both on, on within the Northeast and as well as across North America. Coincidentally, uh, this was also the, uh, uh, the time the Yale Repertory Theater hosted a, uh, its first um, uh, uh, full-scale production uh, written by a Native American playwright. Uh, we had a, a, the East Coast premiere of an amazingly um, successful and uh, uh, well-written uh, kind of a, a drama by Mary Catherine Nagel, who's a Cherokee playwright. Uh, that opened on campus uh, right across the street from our University Art Gallery. That was another strategy we used to kind of highlight the longstanding um, kind of presence of Native Americans in uh, the history of American uh, kind of um, theater and drama and to kind of counteract a lot of simplistic narratives that people often uh, uh, hold. Uh, this uh, play 
some of, uh, if, for those of you who are interested, it, it takes place simultaneously in the 1620s um, and in the late, um, or in, the, in the aftermath of Dutch settlement in the 1620s and in contemporary uh, uh, 21st century America. Um, and highlights the kind of longstanding issues around dispossession and land loss that uh, uh, Delaware and Lenape Indians have kind of confronted both in the historic or colonial period and in contemporary uh, Oklahoma society. It was widely well regarded and it was a, again a part of our attempts on campus to raise awareness of the history of America's kind of multicultural past. Um, so we're, we're working to increase awareness here through a large sets of activities in the performing arts, um, in the indigenous arts, uh, contemporary arts world that we um, that, were, that was at the center of our art show, uh, we even staged a kind of uh, night at the uh, at the museum kind of event uh, where we uh, reserved the uh, opening gallery space and served uh, contemporary Native American cuisine from the Northeast, uh, catered by a Wampanoag um, a caterer, um, and these were all kind of parts of our own kind of campuses efforts to kind of reconcile. Uh, what has often been a kind of missing element within our campus community. We all work often in institutions that celebrate American multiculturalism, but often don't do sufficient justice or even have a sufficient awareness of the indigenous history of some of our own campuses and or institutions. And I think that will be one of the themes that links several of our presentations uh, together. Now, I am a historian by training and vocation. So a lot of my interest in some of these subjects stem from kind of earlier periods of American history. Um, and this is really not, none of these efforts are something that I was, you know, centrally involved, but, you know, I help support in many ways. But I've often kind of worked with the sets of campus uh, community members, particularly students, who kind of uncovered and, you know, taken deep passion and interest in certain things. And I thought I'd just kind of close my kind of introductory kind of uh, remarks about some of the efforts that we're doing here with this kind of remarkable moment in our kind of campus's uh, recent past. In early 2019, um, we hosted a, a delegation of Indian peoples from largely the state of Wisconsin, uh, but many from across the region as well, who are all descendants from, or are members of the Brothertown Indian Nation of Wisconsin, but, and or descendant from a Brotherton Indian community members. And we came together around this object here, this kind of seemingly, um, a mundane or kind of um, uncommon uh, production entitled uh, Indian Melodies. And it was a, uh, the first known um, scored um, uh, musical composition ever written by an, a, a Native American in Euro, Euro American musical notation. Um, and it kind of highlights the, the kind of living relationship, the kind of ongoing kind of collaborations that many of us are trying to build both with, uh, within our own institutions, but also across Native North America. And we basically performed or had performed this musical uh, composition for the first time in over a century in its kind of intended uh, shape note um, musical uh, 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 form. And we, uh, the university website, uh, university campus news ran a, um, ran a, uh, um, a video about it and, we probably don't have time to, to uh, view it, but it's here linked on this Vimeo if people really wanted to kind of um, uh, uh, kind of see the kind of coming together, literally, of indigenous community members from across North America who have a kind of investment in um, kind of uh, understanding and re-engaging the kind of archival or the cultural productions of their ancestors uh, written uh, around this, in this case, uh, Brotherton Indian Melody performed uh, or written in the mid 19th century and performed for the first time in its kind of shape note form um, two years ago here on campus. Uh, that's highlighted in the uh, website that I um, um, uh, began the uh, presentation with, this Yale Group for the Study of Native America. Hopefully this is kind of some introductions to some of the work that's happening here on campus. I look forward to uh, hearing from my colleagues and we'll um, turn it over now to uh, um, uh, Aaron. Is that right? Hey Nick, can you stop, stop, stop screen share? Well, hi, Natana, hi, P. 
Aaron Birdbear, Gahini Gaide. I just said, uh, nice to be here. Uh, and uh, my name is Aaron Birdbear. In the Ho Chunk language, uh, the people of the sacred voice uh, whose ancestral lands the University of Wisconsin Madison occupies. And as I'm a member of the Mandan, Hadatsa, and the Rikara Nation, uh, my mother's a member of the Navajo Nation, um, I'm a guest here in the Western Great Lakes. And I'm the inaugural tribal relations director for the University of Wisconsin Madison. There are about 20 tribal relations directors at various universities across the United States. It's just an emerging area in higher education as people think about uh, the knowledge systems of uh, and indigenous knowledge that's around here that um, can help us benefit to understand the world and the challenges we're all facing collectively together. Um, so here's a map of the Western Great Lakes and there's a red circle. Um, the circle is around De Jop, uh, which was in my title, T-E-E-J-O-P, De Jop, which is a Ho-Chunk language for four lakes. Uh, we can see those four lakes in a circle kind of in the lower uh, center of the map uh, in the treaty and ancestral lands of the Ho-Chunk nation. So we kind of see the treaty sessions, um, the violence back land sessions uh, of the Western Great Lakes. So the Ho-Chunk, the Menominee, the Ojibwe, the Dakota, uh, the Sauk and Meskwaki and Potawatomi. We can, and then we can see the contemporary reservation spaces and the lighter colors on this map. Uh, but this reminds us that everywhere we go on Turtle Island in this wonderful continent of ours is somebody's indigenous home. And uh, it's always important to acknowledge that in someone. Um, I remind us that, uh, you know, settler colonialism, I mean, the goal is replacement. That is the goal. Colonialism is kind of extraction of resources and kind of uh, for capitalistic gains, but settler colonialism is just about replacement. And the great seal of the territory of Wisconsin shows us a graphic novel of settler colonialism action. We have the actual kind of schematic of, of replacement where you have European Americans or Europeans entering from the right side of the seal, which would be kind of the, the east. And we have like a Ho-Chunk figure kind of carrying a bow with a fair feather on the shores of a lake um, about to be deported in a, looks like a steamship of some sort. And we have the terraforming of Wisconsin. So I just remind us that when it comes to preservation, um, you know, often we're focusing on European American or European social and intellectual achievement um, at the cost or expense of kind of obscuring the indigeneity of any space. And that's just a function of settler colonialism itself. And we see the origins of Wisconsin with its uh, motto, civilization succeeds barbarism. Um, is the kind of motto of the state of Wisconsin. So this kind of reminds us of why we don't understand indigenous people sometimes is that the settler colonial education model is designed to obscure indigeneity and it's, it's very successful at doing that often. Uh, just a reminder, you know, 50 years gets us to the National Register of Historic Places, uh, but 50 years is less than half of 1% of the time of human occupation of where I live uh, in Dejo. Um, so 1848 forward is the co-creation of this University of Wisconsin, Madison with statehood. And that's literally the last 1.4% of the human story of our space. So 98.6% of the human story of where our university is located is in, in a language other than English. It's gonna be in indigenous languages and French languages. It's, it's just gonna be a very different connection and understanding Hello. of the environment around us. Um, and to give you a sense of the specialness of this location that I'm in. You'll find a link. And I'm sure someone can uh, mute. Uh, there we go, thank you. Uh, so if you're unfamiliar with the Western Great Lakes, we have this incredible vast linear conical and effigy mound society that creates these massive monuments over the earth. So the, it, Madison and its greater environment should be a United Nations educational, scientific, cultural organization, World Heritage Site, a UNESCO World Heritage Site, because we got these massive monuments that are burial sites uh, for people um, beginning about 3000 years ago and lasting to 700 years ago. So in the snow figure, you can see the legs and tails of the double-tailed water spirit, um, which is right next to one of our buildings called Agriculture Hall. In the lower left, some rake, leaves have been raked off of uh, a goose effigy mound, which is near our kind of Western side of campus. And the upper right shows those two figures, a bird figure and um, a double-tailed water spirit that's built into one of our residence halls. And it's kind of referencing the bent winged goose within the lower right hand map where it's the signature kind of cultural expression of the Four Lakes system, where you'll only find these massive bent wing geese built in the landscape here uh, beginning um, about 1,500 years ago. So extraordinarily special space. And if we looked at Wisconsin, the red circles are always going to show our location on the map, the university or the town I'm living in. Uh, we can see the entirety of south central Wisconsin is this massive uh, cultural expression of linear conical and effigy mounds. So the darker the gray section on the map, the more of these cultural objects you will find. And Madison has over 1,200 of these cultural objects and the map on the right shows us all these little dots that are these clusters of these massive kind of constructions on the earth. Um, 
remembering or celebrating important people in those people's lives and their society. So just an incredibly special place. We should be United Nations Education, Scientific, Cultural Organization, World Heritage Site because of the incredible unique cultural expression here um, that is so vast and so massive and so special. Um, here's a picture of the isthmus in Madison, Wisconsin. So the isthmus is a stretch of land between two lakes. Um, and this is a drawing from 1836, an impressionistic drawing of what you would have found on the isthmus in 1836 in our town, the downtown Madison. The lower left-hand corner is a high hill where our capital would have been located. Um, it, the isthmus kind of runs northeast, southwest between these two lakes. And it just shows all the incredible human development in this space. So it's just a very special space. And then we're likely the most archaeological rich campus of any in the United States. And we can see the incredible archaeological sites of our campus shoreline. Um, so when it comes to preservation, we're, for us, we're really speaking about this kind of habitation and burial sites that are all over our campus property. Um, we have these extant effigy mound sites on campus that we need to take care of. And uh, it's just a really special process for institution. So that's where the intersection really worked for us as an institution, is the learning goals we have for our new students. So we've articulated 10 essential learning outcomes for our first year students, you know, four broad learning outcomes for the American Association of Colleges and Universities, kind of essential learning outcomes for undergraduates in education. And we just can see very clearly uh, the importance of helping people see different perspectives, um, to learn about different cultures. And so we built Dejope Residence Hall. We asked the Ho-Chunk Nation to name the hall. They named it Dejope after um, the village they used to have on the, on the isthmus. And we can see, you can't really see it from the picture, but um, the building itself is shaped like a gigantic bird. So it's meant to reference the effigy mound landscape around us. And there are interpretive parts within the building to help us learn more. Um, in 2016, we started inviting uh, indigenous speakers to the freshman convocation, kind of acknowledging this space um, in, in the words of the kind of indigenous leaders of this space. And so it's just a really important step for us in terms of understanding what we need to preserve or understanding the landscape underneath us because settler colonialism has been so effective in, in obscuring the very specialness of the space that goes back 12,000 years on our campus. And then lastly, uh, we were accelerating our teaching and learning about indigenous peoples and in, uh, of this space and understanding the 12,000 year specialness of our campus. And uh, we started the Our Shared Future effort on our campus, incentivizing faculty, schools, departments, colleges to submit grants to teach about this space, incorporating indigenous worldview into that teaching. So the Our Shared Future effort um, started with a heritage marker, kind of acknowledging the contest of, and colonization of this space and the incredible resilience and agency of the Ho-Chunk Nation to remain in this space despite uh, six military campaigns and 40 years of failed ethnic cleansing against them. And so we're telling that story in this marker, but the marker travels around campus as different schools and colleges host it to teach us about this space. So I think our most effective ways have been thinking about learning goals for students, thinking about the mission of our institution and thinking about how the indigeneity of our campus can leverage learning, can enhance learning in some way and meet the learning goals we have for students. So that's just what I wanted to share today, just about how we're approaching at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. And I'll turn it over to my colleague, I believe Rebecca Comfort, um, who uh, works uh, for the Wisconsin Historical Society here in Madison. Yes, Anin Buju, uh, Rebecca Comfort, Indijnikov, um, Hunabe Indian community in Dojaba. Uh, so hello, good morning or afternoon, uh, everyone, depending on where you are tuning in from. Uh, my name is Rebecca Comfort, and I am the inaugural American Indian Nations liaison with the Wisconsin Historical Society. Uh, previously, I've worked um, actually with Erin for quite a long time. That goes back to my time in undergrad um, and then professionally in the School of Education at UW-Madison uh, as the former American Indian Curriculum Services Consultant. Um, that job and very much uh, kind of tied to what I do now um, is teaching and reminding my colleagues and peers how we think about and understand and construct meaning um, and what the inclusion or lack thereof uh, really tells us about our values and notions of power and place that we tend to reinforce um, that were you know, fundamentally kind of set up in, in the framing um, and nation building of our country. Um, 
Now, as, as an indigenous person of the Western Great Lakes, um, I would mentioned that I'm also an enrolled member of the Kuna Bay Indian community based out of the Upper Peninsula of Michigan, although I'm a lifelong resident of Wisconsin. Uh, the, the colonial veneer that Aaron was, was really alluding to and discussing in his presentation about how we think of the scope of history and place um, to indigenous people, you know, we, we look at narratives that go back 12,000 plus years um, compared to, you know, the, the visual cues that we see um, all across our landscape that really only show and tell the story of the very, very last, um, I believe it's 1.4% um, of our human history in this place. So today, you know, when I'm thinking about uh, what what has historic preservation means, um, how it is intimately related and tied to um, settler colonialism, the continuation of it, even if it 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 is not as obvious and apparent uh, in some people's minds or in the ways that we orient ourselves. Um, but how fundamentally important it is to understand the, the vehicles that cultural institutions act as and the work that they carry out, whether it is through um, storytelling in museums and exhibitions, uh, curation um, and display and reinforcement of what we value in terms of importance to our identity, um, and how we, we share out these notions, you know, not just with ourselves and with each other, um, but also to, to visitors of these places, right? To, to people who perhaps are coming here and thinking, um, you know, what is, what is the identity um, of this place, of the community, of the people, and how are we reinforcing it or otherwise? Um, in particular, something that the, the Wisconsin Historical Society, um, uh, a branch that we encompass in our work, um, would be the, the State Historic Preservation Office. Um, you know, and every, every state has a SHPO. Um, however, you know, usually the, the SHPO and perhaps where the state archaeologist is located, as well as some of these other fundamental services that come along with, with states, but perhaps are uh, you know, not together under one roof. Um, we have a really interesting, I think, and robust um, opportunity through the work that the Wisconsin Historical Society does um, uh, in SHPO to look at historic preservation, um, national register nominations. Uh, you know, we assist um, a lot of uh, organizations and institutions that uh, you know, are looking to apply for national recognition um, and listing on the National Register of Historic Places. And one of the interesting projects um, that have, has been going on for about the last five years or so, perhaps a little bit longer, um, is thinking about how we can take the principles and a uh, very narrowly defined um, five categories that we uh, are listing uh, national register um, nominations and places under and adapt that and expand that so that it can perhaps apply to uh, non-Western views um, of importance of place and space uh, and how we connect um, you know, meaning and then signify the value of these things. In particular, the, uh, the Menominee Nation, which is uh, one of the, the 12 American Indian nations of Wisconsin, has been working with us for the last um, five plus years on uh, building a nomination that acknowledges um, the origin story, the place of uh, the Menominee Nation's creation. Uh, which takes place on uh, the boundaries of the Menominee River uh, up on the, the Wisconsin and Upper Peninsula border. Um, it's a particularly challenging process as I'm sure that you know, anyone either from our offices at the Historical Society um, as well as uh, the Menominee Nation um, and archeologists archeo that they're working with can tell you, um, what, what we really you know, discovered in this process has revealed is 
how narrow the scope of uh, the scope of recognition or willingness um, by our you know our process that we go through for the national register nominations. Um, how those five categories really are narrow and somewhat limiting when we are looking at you know symbolizing and ensuring that we can capture the importance that is imbued not in the physical um, manifestation of you know a, a structure or a building, um, but of the collective impact and importance of a place where that value and, and notion of identity and importance uh, is so paramount, but it, it lives within our cultural, our, our cultural viewpoints um, and how we are socialized, where these two things are not necessarily matching up. So, you know, when I think about expanding uh, the, the shared story that we really do have to tell um, you know, in this place that we now collectively refer to as the United States uh, fairly recently, then we need to also be asking ourselves, um, what are the ways that we are defining and reinforcing value, importance, uh, and inclusion or the ability to, to include fundamentally things that challenge uh, these, these very kind of, you know, narrowly defined categorical um, visualization and conceptualize, conceptualizing what, what importance means um, and how we can, can continue to kind of mend that, that divide um, and heal the trauma that has, has, you know, really profoundly impacted indigenous people and continues to today. Um, so I would like to kind of leave it at that and um, just be here as you know one a resource to to kind of expand on the narrative and the dialogue um, that that requires all of us to collectively have in our spaces um, and being mindful of you know self self aware and mindful of how you know we are thinking about um, and rethinking how we construct meaning um, and how we can kind of shift towards a more inclusive uh, picture and uh, approach to you know, how we collectively shape and share our national identity and that narrative with others. So now I believe I am turning it over to Brian. Good morning, Kwatsi Hopa. Uh, my name is Brian Vio, and I am the governor at the Pueblo of Acoma tribe in New Mexico. Acoma Pueblo is located about 60 miles west of Albuquerque. And um, this homeland is quite special to us. Um, not only our place here in Acoma, but the, the broader landscape that um, our ancestors occupied for um, and migrated on for, for, you know, throughout history. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about <clears throat> the work that we've been involved in here in Acoma. Uh, prior to my appointment as governor of the Pueblo, um, I was the director of the Indian Arts Research Center at the School for Advanced Research in Santa Fe. Prior to that, I did a lot of work in historic preservation, uh, focus on repatriation uh, of ancestors and their associated funerary materials, as well as cultural patrimony. And so this has been a, a long journey um, for my Pueblo, uh, for tribes in general throughout the country. And, um, you know, uh, there, there might, there, some of you might be, be familiar with the federal law, the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act of 1990. And, and we, we have a history, a recent history of uh, involvement of um, implementing that law and really trying to understand um, the intent and the mechanics of, of then how all of that plays out. And it's been a very, very much a challenge. Um, <clears throat> but we are very much um, engaged in this process here at the Pueblo. 
1990 when the law was passed. Um, and shortly thereafter, I had been appointed to serve as a tribal official at that time and um, as a lieutenant governor. And it was really my first introduction to um, this, these federal processes around the uh, protection of cultural resources, but also to this uh, concept of repatriation. And um, I served a thir three year term as a tribal official and following that appointment, I had the opportunity to work as a tribe's um, first director of historic preservation. So my first conference actually at the National Trust Conference was in 1997 uh, when it took place in Santa Fe. Um, <clears throat> and um, at that time I was serving as a director of historic preservation. And so some of the things that are, are critical and that are still happening, you know, for ACMA, this happened in the 19, late 1990s. But we have some tribes today who are really just now, you know, setting the, the foundation for this type of work and engagement with folks like the National Trust and the um, National Park Service and other federal agencies and state agencies, uh, but also this now uh, incredible network of preservationists that exists uh, throughout the country and the world. Um, so it's great to see that development. However, what I, what I will say is that in doing, setting these, these things up, these Western uh, models of, um, and tweaking them to, to fit our needs, um, it, it, it is a challenge because for many of us, <clears throat> let's take repatriation for concern, uh, for, for example, many of us um, don't have processes for the reburial of ancestors. A lot of us don't have um, established processes for, you know, conducting consultation around these issues because the information is so sensitive. And a lot of times that information is kept within and not necessarily shared with, um, uh, with, with folks outside of our tribes. And so you, it, it takes a lot of um, not only the critical thought, but also the uh, attention to the internal um, sensitivities around culture and traditions and history and access to the traditional knowledge and uh, access to the resources within. And what I'm talking about here are the cultural leaders, the elders and others who are keepers and protectors of this, this knowledge. So, you know, you have to, uh, we, we've had to break the mold and we've had to patch it up even uh, in some uh, respects uh, in order to do this work uh, from this concept of Western, you know, uh, preservation. So, you know, today the Pueblo of Acoma, um, you know, remains at the forefront on issues around protection of cultural landscapes, the protection of sacred sites, the um, repatriation, continued repatriation of ancestors and their associated materials. But we're also very much engaged um, with a network of federal partners and private partners and tribes to have an impact on the, on the development of new policy. New policy uh, to protect cultural landscapes and sacred sites, but also a uh, new policy that um, protects cultural patrimony. Um, some of you might be familiar with the um, repatriation or return of a sacred shield that was up for auction in, uh, in the Eve Auction House in Paris. And um, Akama, this, uh, this was an Akama ceremonial shield. And it took some time to, uh, for the people, uh, people of Akama to really um, figure out a process here. And there were many different ways that this was approached. Uh, in the end, it uh, involved the federal government who we insisted be a partner in this process and who you know we're grateful that um, who stepped up and who assisted us with um, um, 
ultimately reclaiming um, that ceremonial shield. But it was a process and we learned a tremendous amount from that experience. And many tribes throughout the country and indigenous peoples throughout the world are, are having these you know, similar types of experiences. But in the process of these, you know, going through these, the, these um, actions and uh, investing time and, and tremendous amount of resources to get this work done. Uh, and while we might experience these successes, it's clear that there's still a tremendous amount of work to be done. There's still a tremendous amount of education that needs to happen um, for within mainstream society, uh, especially when we consider some of the, uh, the folks who have presented before, before me have laid out some really important uh, facts and situations that we have in this country and abroad. But when, we still, when we're still facing those issues um, around you know, uh, the, the racial tensions, the, the lack of inclusion and equity um, and justice for all, you know, those things play out in this, when, we, when we attempt to do this work. And um, it's, it's unfortunate, but I think you know, in, the, in our recent history, we're seeing some, some movement and I want to say that, you know, ACMA has also had a long time relationship with the National Trust for Historic Preservation uh, since the late 1990s. And so we've engaged with the trust on a number of things and projects and initiatives here in the Southwest and projects here at the Pueblo. But um, one of the things that I'm really excited about and hope to be more involved in is you know, as the trust is reevaluating and rethinking the ways in which it engages with Native America and other indigenous peoples, um, I, I hope to see some development here where this is concerned. Um, I think that this time, and certainly this very challenging time that we are all experiencing, certainly is raising uh, a few more red flags for for all of us and. Um, I, I hope leading us down the same path of, you know, coming together and work to work together and to make a commitment um, to Im better improve systems and, and policy, but also to generate and foster a much greater understanding of, of the, the issues um, facing Native America, but also the ways in which then we can partner and collaborate to help you know, shift a, a paradigm that um, and, and a narrative that is oftentimes um, uh, either erroneous or uh, based on uh, a Western way of, uh, of thinking about history and preservation, but one that transitions to something that is truly in, based in indigenous knowledge and indigenous understandings um, and the cultural values that really guide our own way of thinking about preservation. You know, I don't. I was trying to think <clears throat> uh, earlier about, and I've done had the, had this thought process before. Of, is there a word in our language, in the Akama language, for preservation? And there really is not. Uh, there are other concepts that we use, like "bahu um, utrani," uh, which is to to protect, um, and or um, some to, to care for something. Um, and so, you know, we need to be thinking about these indigenous concepts as well as we think about our work um, ahead in shifting these, these narrative, narratives and paradigms and policy, um, but also ensuring that we all have our place um, at the table. So, there's a, a tremendous amount of work that needs to be done. ACMA is, uh, remains uh, very committed to this process. We are currently working um, to save places like Chaco Canyon, uh, which is an ancestral homeland for us. The uh, many other um, locations within the Four Corners region of the country, including Bears Ears. Um, and we're making some good headway, um, but uh, more work lies ahead for all of us. So I just wanted to, to share a little bit about uh, all of this and 
I'm looking forward to um, participating in the remainder of uh, this year's conference. It's a challenging time for us, and I hope that all of you and your families are safe and in good health. Thank you. Why Haskell Kuss, Isquis Lori Arnold, Kinson Ikes, Kabul Confederated Tribes. I am the next panelist uh, today, Lynn Lent. Thank you to everyone, all of my colleagues on this session. I've learned an enormous amount. I am the Director of Native American Studies and an Associate Professor of History at Gonzaga University. I think uh, some of what I will discuss will resonate more closely with Ned's introduction to this session. Um, Gonzaga University is a private university. It's a Jesuit institution. So we do not have the, um, I think the critical mass of people that state institutions do, but the success of Native American studies at Gonzaga is built on regional partnerships with institutions across the Columbia Plateau, the indigenous plateau is what I call it. And so I'm gonna speak a little bit today about ways that Gonzaga through Native American studies engages with um, our local communities and our local partners. Gonzaga's aim through Native American studies is to indigenize all of our spaces at Gonzaga. And that includes the way that our students work um, on their assignments, the ways that they learn to reframe their perspectives um, from the inside out, and the ways that they understand Spokane in particular, but the plateau as an indigenous space. It was and remains the indigenous Columbia Plateau. And I'm going to show you a couple of maps to orient you. So um, when I speak about the indigenous plateau, this is what I mean. These are uh, some of the tribal groups. When I say Sinaixt, we are also called the Lakes Band. Um, we are, our ancestral territories go way up here uh, into the Arrow Lakes. Um, we are now part of the Colville Confederated Tribes in Washington State. Um, However, Sinaiq's people are in the process of seeking recognition and restoration of ancestral rights in Canada. And our case was heard before the Canadian Supreme Court on October 8th. We await a decision about that. All of the lower cases in Canada have returned in Sinaiq's favor. So part of what I'll address today is interpreting um, our territories in two nations, um, in two, uh, in two nation states. So we interpret in the United States, but then we also interpret up here in Canada, in what is currently Canada, what is currently British Columbia. And so when I say me, I'm speaking as a Sinex person, I'm not speaking as a representative of the Colville Confederated Tribes. So um, I'll spend a couple of minutes on that, but I wanted to begin today, since language preservation is so integral to all of the work that uh, nations and tribes are doing in, as part of their cultural restoration. I wanted to share one of the publications um, from our region. Um, this comes from the Umatilla tribe. It's published by the Temascalit Cultural Institute in Pendleton, Oregon. Uh, they are not forgotten. Um, you can find this, I'm sure you can find it um, through the Temascalit website. I'm sure you can also find it through um, other book dealers. So this is Sahaptian Place Names Atlas. They worked with tribal elders and uh, language and knowledge holders to create these, um, <clears throat> to identify and interpret these place names in, um, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> in Sahaptian dialects using Sahaptian languages for the place names. And that, as we know, centering those places from indigenous perspectives is the only way to really learn about them. Calling a place, you know, um, in our region, for example, um, Mount Adams doesn't say anything about what the Yakimas know about Mount Adams. 
it just says that some guy named Adams is associated with it for some reason. So uh, the, the Umatillas published this, they are not forgotten place names document. The Cobble Tribes also has a place name document that is available on the Cobble Tribes website. And you can see it here. It's a large PDF file, but it is publicly available. And at Gonzaga, we use this, we use these documents to learn place, region, people, and histories. And so these are a very important part of our regional partnerships and um, our external engagement with the ancestral peoples and the contemporary peoples of our place. And um, these regional partnerships are really developing all the way down um, from here. Um, so here is, Spokane is right down here. Um, and then our partnerships span from Castlegar and Nelson, British Columbia, all the way down uh, into Oregon. And those institutions are Selker College in Nelson, BC, um, the Northwest Museum of Arts and Culture in Spokane, the High Desert Museum in Bend, Oregon, and colleges and universities throughout the region. And so Native American Studies at Gonzaga builds from indigenous knowledge of place, and personhood, and then we focus that out. We push that out as much as we can through student assignments, through student work, um, whether it's interpreting art or other um, histories. We don't just reside as much as possible. We try not to only reside within the university space. And, um, and this is significant, of course, because it helps students understand something outside themselves. And, um, and learn to engage with the peoples around them. So I'll also share, I just have a minute left here. So I'm, I'm also going to share this image of the sharpening stone, which is very, important to Northern Plateau people. The Sharpening Stone is currently located near Kettle Falls, Washington. Um, Grand Coulee Dam submerged Kettle Falls uh, when the water from Grand Coulee Dam flooded the Columbia River. And so this stone actually used to be located lower than it is, but, um, but Cobble people moved it to high ground so that we could still access it um, and so we could still rely on it. And this was in 1940. So the Kabul people had the vision that this, this stone was representative of millennia of hunters and fishers coming to sharpen their blades on the stone and use that stone as a point of cultural connection, um, as well as a, as a utility, as a utilitarian item. And so relocated it so that it would be above the flooded uh, waters. And, um, and now it resides here and it's still a touchstone, a literal touchstone for us. And so this is a photo of the way that it looks. And then here is this um, piece that was interpreted from the Washington historical marker about it. Um, which shows more of, um, of an outdated, you know, sort of um, approach to interpretation. So, um, so we use these contrasts between the more outdated interpretation and then the focus on the tribal narrative as a way to engage with students about place and about uh, homelands uh, here on the plateau. And so um, I'm just gonna leave you with this image and let that speak for itself. Um, I see that Rebecca is commenting on Amy Lone Tree's um, work, not just on decolonizing archeology, span but decolonizing uh, museums. We also use that 
um, we draw on that and rely on it an enormous amount um, in the Native American Studies program. So I'm gonna turn it over back over to Ned and he's gonna wrap us up. Thank you very much, Lynn Lent. Thank you, uh, Lori, Rebecca, Aaron, and Brian for what was a wonderfully um, informative, if somewhat brief uh, session together. I'm sorry we don't have time for uh, questions from the audience, but it seems like there's been a very uh, productive chat going on and there's plenty more resources. I think each of us left uh, uh, our kind of collective audience with uh, resources to draw upon. Um, feel free to reach out um, to some of those session organizers. Uh, many of us are also um, able in various capacities to respond to uh, uh, correspondence. Uh, and I wish everyone a very successful conference in the days ahead. Uh, it's been a wonderful honor to be part of this uh, process so far. And uh, I look forward to attending one of these uh, association meetings in person someday, as I'm sure everyone else does as well. Um, I'll just, yeah. I'll just, uh, hi everyone, this is Priya Chai again, just going to say uh, join us for the LGBTQIA session in about 10 minutes, um, and thank you for joining us. Have a great day, and uh, welcome to Pass Forward.